I'm uh, very happy to be here and I didn't understand everything <laughs> but since I trust the Yongnam <laughs> I hope that you only say good things on the other hand this reminded me of a very nice joke which I was told by Nirenberg and uh, it's, it's about uh, uh, an old professor who is really turning say old for me now is 80 okay he's only 80 years old and so somebody's talking about him and the guy is 80 years old so he falls asleep and uh, at a certain moment he wakes up and he says but you say nothing about his modesty <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know I just happen to okay so what I want to talk it's something okay if you go to to Paris and you go there is La Sorbonne then they are like these main buildings and these are like the major things uh, in in science or and you see that there is geometry algebra and then philosophy and I forgot so um, nowadays uh, this is considered maybe to be old and people like new things, but uh, since I was born in Florence, which is a, is a town where you face yourself every day with the past, each time there is something new, the Florentine they says, oh, but this is not really new, it has these roots here, and then we conclude it's not really new. And I think it's a healthy thing to always go back and see uh, that confront the new ideas with the old ones and uh, maybe the new ideas they become uh, much deeper. So what I want to do is a colloquium which is quite elementary so uh, uh, what I want to discuss first is configurations of line of lines in P2. So I apologize for the experts and or the people I will say something which is very elementary so um, well what is the projective plane the projective plane at a certain moment uh, maybe with, with Hilbert and Gulag and the geometry it's, a, it's a, a projective plane satisfies three axioms so axiom for P2 There are also actions for Pn, but I mean, to be short, given two points for each two points. This is the first axiom for each two points A1, uh, P and Q, P1, P2. There exists a unique line L containing P1 and P2. And this is called, uh, L is called the line P1, P2. And the second axiom says that given two lines, L1, L2 may be different, then also here the two points should be different for each two lines the intersection is of two lines is a point okay now uh, this is not enough and even some very famous mathematicians they put the third axiom wrong as I noticed but I don't only at dinner I will tell the name this doesn't prohibit that you take the points of the line and the point outside. And so you want that this really it's more than projecting a line from one point. So there is a third axiom uh, that exists a projective basis P1 before such that no three of them are collinear
Now, uh, from this, from these uh, four points, which are the bases, you take the complete quadrangle. So the quadrangle, this means that you take these four points, and the six lines, PI, PJ. This is a completely uninteresting, apparently, but I will try to convince you of the opposite configuration. So we have P1, P2, P3. Now, uh, You take the midpoints here, and so you take now the line through the body center. And you call it, you call the body center is P4. So I have four points in the plane. So don't, I will make this picture as elementary, and the reason why I like to give a picture on the blackboard is that if you don't understand the figure, it remains there, it doesn't go away immediately like with the Beamer presentation. I will not number the line because I will do it afterwards in a clever way. Uh, now, this is a little bit of history. Cart Car Descartes introduced the Cartesian coordinates, but they are the so-called the projective and the affine coordinates, they were introduced uh, in uh, a paper by Möbius, and the book was called Das Barycentrische Kalkül, and they are the barycentrical coordinates, which should be introduced in every lecture of linear algebra. So P1 is the point, 1, 0, 0. P2 is the point 0, 1, 0. P3 is the point 0, 0, 1. And the body center P4 is the point 1, 1, 1, or if you want, one third of this. So they, uh, these are, if you remove, if you look a vector up to proportionality, this is the vector 1, 1, 1, and in projective space you get the projective coordinates. This is equivalent to lambda x, lambda y, lambda z for lambda different from zero. Otherwise, if you're working in a fine geometry, you want that the sum of the coordinates is equal to 1. And that's why, and you see there are a lot of beautiful elementary theorems which stem from this. This is, this length is a half of this. Because P4 is, uh, you take this midpoint here, and it is one third this plus two thirds this. And this is now, we see it, you prove it, but in higher dimension, now you take four points, and that is the same theorem. There is a body center, and the ratio is three to four, and in general, this generalizes n minus one over n divided by n. So there is a lot of beautiful geometry, and you start with the geometry, and then you, it becomes very easy algebra, and this is interesting geometry. And then there are other, So, uh, this is the Mabius configuration. Uh, there are six lines. So, this co uh, the complete quadrangle is a configuration for uh, three and six, two. So, this means there are, this means there are four points
and through each point there pass three lines and then you have six lines and each line contains two of the given points. So this is the meaning of this notation. Now, uh, one is accustomed that uh, a quadrangle and the quadrilatera are the same. This is not true. You see, now I take a quadrilateral. Now, if I take a quadrilateral, I should better take some color chalk and so of this I make these lines I make them become yellow okay now I have four lines now uh, I should recall another thing is that before the duality of vector spaces, which is very hard when you teach undergraduates to understand, and the only way is to remember that duality was introduced by Jergon in, I don't know, somewhere 1600. So given a project, in this case, given a projective plane, that a dual plane has points which uh, are L star, where L is a line in P2, and P2 has lines, P star, where P is a point in P2. So one sees that, in fact, in the axioms, uh, and we say that P belongs to L, is equivalent uh, to the line P star, dual of P, contains the point dual of L. So duality is interesting, was in the beginning interesting from the logical point of view, because for every theorem, you could take the mirror theorem or the dual theorem where you changed point with line, line with point, and the, uh, sorry, and the relation. So it's like uh, you have a relation between two sets, the points and the lines, and then you exchange the two things. And now the non-triviality gives me the dual conf configuration is the complete quadrilateral. And this is uh, uh, four lines, the four yellow lines, and th uh, the six intersection points. Okay, so. Uh, in projective geometry, um, okay. so now if you view it as a quadrilateral, these are the four sides, then these, there are three more lines, the line which joins P1 with P4, then there is the line which joins P2 with P3, and then there is uh, another uh, there are other lines, there is, for instance, the line joining this. So, um, there is a theorem uh, of the we come to the first theorem of the complete quadrilateral.
we are showing there. No, sorry. P1, uh, what is missing? P2, P3, P1, P4, and... Um, ah, this one there. This, so there are four lines, four sides, and then these other are the three diagonals. I'll come to the theorem. So the theorem of a complete quadrilateral says that uh, the uh, The two lines, the two, uh, each two diagonal cut the third in uh, two points. So now the picture which I did was not thinking about this complete quadrilateral, so I should really uh, yeah, one, two, three points, okay? So here is one diagonal, and here are the other two diagonal. They cut in two points. Uh, they cut the third, cut the third, say, PI, uh, sorry, uh, cut the third in two points, which... Uh, together with the other two points to form a so-called harmonic set. So what does it mean a harmonic set? Um, which means that the cross ratio is belongs to the set to one ha half minus one. So I, let me explain what is the cross ratio for people who are not trained in geometry. So definition, the cross ratio of P1, P2, P3, and P4 is lambda for P1, P4, on the projective line. So whenever you get four points on a line, the cross ratio is lambda. This means, now also to be precise, P1, P2, P3 are different. If and only if there exists a projectivity, uh, there exists a projectivity uh, sending P1 to and P4 to infinity, P2 to 0, P3 to 1, and P4 to lambda. And the way this is proven is just by this projectivity is obtained by means of uh, composition of, uh, of two projections. So you first take these four points and then you project on the other diagonal from here and then you take the other perspectivity from here. So let me make a better picture. I should do this other picture, but maybe I do like this. Here is one diagonal, 
Here's the two. So you get these four points here. And then, then you project with center from this point on this other line. So you take this line here and you project on this from this point with center this point. You take the perspective. So you take um, the perspective with center P4 from the line L which is P2, P3 to uh, the line uh, L prime which is the line P3, P4. So the perspective I should, you take two lines, the perspective is simply a transformation from a point which uh, sends each point of L, you, for each point here, you connect with O and then you cut with L prime. So first you do the, the, uh, the perspective with center P4 and then you do the perspective with center P1. And what happens is that these points goes here and then goes here, these points goes here and then goes here, these two points are fixed. So uh, the effect is that P2 is exchanged with P3. And from this, this you see, there's a nice thing about projective geometry, you can do proofs just with pictures. The cross ratio of these four points is the same as the one when you exchange these two points and this translates into equation lambda squared is equal to one which has root. Now what is interesting, uh, there should have been a subtitle for this chapter 1-1 one, one, which is Fano. Gino Fano Fano's configuration is the same configuration. So here you see you expect that you have this side, but then you expect that there are other sides and you continue forever. Hmm? This is false. Fano in this article on the Cyclopedia of Mathematics in 19, 18, 19, and 19, something like this, what he found is that if you take now uh, the projective space over the field with two elements. This is the simplest field which you have. You have zero and one only. Then what happens is that uh, yeah, all these three points, now what are these points? This is the midpoint here. It lies, this is the line x2 equals zero. So this is the point. 1, 0, 1. This is the point uh, 0, 1, 1. Now, this in this plane, P2 of Z2 is just Z2 cubed minus 0 because uh, there are only coordinates 0 and 1, so you just take any vector. There are seven points. Now, by duality, there are seven lines. And you see, we have already six lines. One, two, the four, yellow, and the two. And there is a seven line. And there is a line x1, uh, or x plus y plus z equals zero is a line containing the remaining three points.
And so, it's very strange, but this line is like a circle, goes around here. And this is the funnel, the simplest projective plane with seven, there cannot be less than six, and they are exactly, the minimum is seven points and seven lines, and it's a configuration of type seven points through each point, three lines, and then seven lines through each point, there are three. Now, does this contradict the theorem of the complete quadrangle? Not really, it's quite beautiful, because in the field Z mod 2, or in any field with characteristic 2, what happens is 2 is equal to 0. And 1 half is infinity, because it's 1 over 0, and minus 1 is equal to 1. So the upshot is that with this value of the cross ratio, you have three points, but the fourth point is one of them. So the calculation, the algebraic calculation, fits in perfectly. So the theorem says these are exactly three points. So this diagonal just, they all meet, both diagonals meet here. Okay, so this is the interesting configuration. Now, one, two is other famous uh, Desarg and Pappos. So, this is again a beautiful theorem of uh, projective geometry, which uh, uh, was discovered in 1600. So, Desarg theorem is called the theorem of homological triangles. What does it mean that two triangles homo homologically simply means that you put a bijection you take A, B, C, and the other you call A prime, B prime, and C prime. So this means that you give two triangles, three points in the plane, and you give a bijection between the first set of points and the other set, so to A, A. And so he says the theorem of homological uh, triangles Say, says that uh, the lines uh, connecting homological uh, points run through a point, if and only if the, uh, the three points intersection of homological sides are, colli uh, are collinear. So, says the following. In one direction, you take three lines through a point O. And then you take A, B, 
and C, and then A prime, C prime, and B prime. Now the construction is that the lines which connect pairs of corresponding vertices, they all go through a point. Now I take the intersection points of corresponding sides. To AB corresponds A prime B prime. I denote the intersection point by C double prime. The intersection of AC A prime C prime I would call B double prime. And the intersection of BC B prime double prime is A double prime. And the upshot is that these three points, they are collinear. So you see that there's been, there's a lot of culture in concrete geometry. So this was a beautiful discovery. And now I only did one direction because using the duality, you can see that this implication is dual to the other one. Now, the interest was lost. It's a little bit complicated, but there is, uh, at the time of the new foundations of geometry uh, done by Hilbert, it turned out that the Zarg, so a good reference for this is also a good, uh, this book by Artin, Geometric Algebra, which means, um, yeah, algebraic geometry means that you prove uh, some geometrical statement uh, with algebra and that's the other way around. And, th and there is an important fact is that P2 satisfies the Zarg if P2 is contained in a projective space of dimension 3. This was proven by Enriquez in his first lecture when he became full professor at the age of 25. These were other times where people didn't have to suffer so much for doing mathematics, at least if they were a genius like Enriquez. And th so there's a beautiful construction because there is a theorem in the space, but what's most important also the desired property holds if and only if there exists a skew field such that P2 is the projective plane associated to this skew field. So the theorem of the Zarg, as you can read in Artin's book, is equivalent to the introduction of coordinates on this Q field. And another theorem which is quite interesting is the Pappus theorem. If an hexagon uh, is inscribed in two lines, in uh, the union of two lines, then the intersection points, the three points, uh, I take pi pli i plus one, this is the side i, and I intersect with pi plus 3 pi plus 4 intersection of opposite sides are collinear. And here I, of course, I just take I as a number, modulo 6, I have a sex, an hexagon, P1, so you see that the opposite side of P1, P2 is just 
P4. P5, which is important if you want the computer to do the calculations. And what is important is the theorem is that Pappos holds if and only if uh, for P to K if and only if K is commutative. Now, when I was young and I was applying for some jobs in Napoli, then I remember I knew nothing and there was, I had to write a dissertation. It was a fine ordered non-Desargoesian planes. So my friend turned to me and says, how do you write this question? So this is very technical and shows how sometimes positions are given in mathematics. So now, how do you find the plane which doesn't satisfy this axiom? Now, there are two ways. One you find in the book of Hartshorn on projective geometry. It's complicated, but there is a brilliant idea of Hughes So the idea is that you take this picture and you turn it, but then the points, the right, so a uh, plane, so they get the points are the points of P2, the points are the same as in the real projective plane. Then there is the line at infinity. Then there are the lines with a negative slope. And now the kick, the, the brilliant idea, is that then for positive slope, so whenever you get a line with positive slope, you intersect with the real line. And now this angle here is, um, if this angle is theta, now uh, your line will be this line here, but then you take angle theta halves. And so this very simple idea, which with these lines, the axioms are verified, but the theorem of the Zarg is not true. And this, you know, that uh, this kind of geometry became important because it was related uh, somehow configurations, they produce groups. And the classification of groups through geometries was one of the, of the main uh, thrusts, I mean, main enterprises of the last century. Now, where is the algebraic geometry? Okay, now comes the configuration which, for which I cannot make a picture. Here you see the configuration uh, with algebra. So I take now the projective uh, plane over a field, and so every curve of the degree 3 which is smooth without singular points is one is contained is one C lambda where C lambda is given by the equation x y z plus six uh, sorry um, uh, I think it's six lambda, it, it, which is which, um, yeah. So you start with the Fermat cubic, x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed plus six lambda x y z equal zero. And lambda belongs to P1, so 
there is also the possibility that lambda infinity. So for lambda infinity, you get x, y, z equal 0, which is a triangle. Now, the reason why Hesse introduced this, uh, this uh, so-called Hesse pencil is he, he was studying the flexes. A flex is a point where uh, the curvature changes sign, or if you want, is a zero of the curvature. Now, the curvature is something which you can make completely algebraic. And now, uh, the Hessian of lambda is the curve given if you call this polynomial is the matrix of, uh, is the determinant of the Hesse matrix whose entries are the partial derivatives, the second partial derivatives uh, of the defining equation. So, and the flexes are the intersection of C lambda with H lambda. So now it's some exercise which I could do for you, but time is rather short. So uh, what I want to do now is, now H lambda is easily calculated, and H lambda here is 2 lambda cubed plus 1 x, y, z minus lambda squared x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed. And so you see that you are intersecting two uh, curves of degree 3, but you see that these are again h lambda is again a linear combination for x, y, z and the Fermat polynomial, the sum of the cubes. And so the flexes are given, they are either x, y, z equal x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed equals zero and you can easily calculate these points because if x is 0, y cubed plus z cubed equals 0. This means there are the points 0, 1, and the third root of uh, minus 1, and so on. So you can really calculate these points, but sometimes, or h lambda is equal to c lambda. Either these two, you have a vector space of dimension 2, either h lambda and c lambda are linearly independent and you get these nine points, or it's the same. But if a curve is such that each point is a flex point, what is the answer? If the curvature is always 0, it's a line, well, locally. So these means that at each point it's a line, so you get a triangle. Now calculation, this occurs if and only if lambda is infinity or lambda cubed is uh, equal to one fourth. So the upshot, the beautiful thing is that in these pencils, all curves are smooth, except there are four triangles. So, from this follows, there comes a beautiful configuration, nine points, the nine flexes, and twelve lines, and now, each line contains three points, and each through each 
of these points, they pass four lines. This is the famous theorem, given two flexes of a smooth cubic, the line joining them intersects the cubic in the third point, which is collinear. And this theorem is now, uh, you know, there is coding theory and cubic elliptic, they're called elliptic curves. And, and there is this beautiful geometry, and there is a theorem that such uh, a configuration is unique. Any configuration of this is unique, and there is nothing to do. Now, uh, what is now the main point? I'm sorry, I, will, I think I will spend most of my time on the elementary part, unless people protest, but... Uh, so, you might ask, why don't I make a picture? I made some stupid picture of the triangles, but this configuration requires that I take... Uh, uh, here there is a mistake, I think. Uh, um. Yeah, sorry, here. You see that here, this point requires the cubic root of minus one, and this is not a real number. All the, you see, one root is minus one, but the other two are complex conjugate. And there is a, a, a theorem There does not exist a finite set of points in a projective space over the reals, non-collinear, such that uh, for each i j, the line p i p j contains a third point. This is not possible over the reals, and the reason is very simple. First of all, you can project this, so idea. Project 2p2. And without loss of generality, it's a finite set of points. Assume that these points are in the R2. So if you don't like projective, I, you can ask the same question for R2. Why is it not possible to have these points which are not collinear? And the reason is that you just take, uh, take the minimum of the distance of pi with the pj, you take all the possible lines and all the possible points. It's a finite set, there will be a minimum. So pj, uh, pi, pj, pk. And then there is this pi. And you see, this distance should be minimal. But that's false, because now I take this line here, and you see that this distance is shorter than this distance. You have to take the distance of the non-collinear points, of course. You know, the minimum of the non-collinear points. Yes. And the same if uh, this falls in the middle. Okay, so this is quite, uh, it's quite interesting. So that's why this you find this configuration, one of these configurations on Hilbert's book on Anschaulich geometry. So, this theorem that the 
this theorem that there exists only one configuration of this type is called in geometrical terms strong rigidity. This, every configuration with this property is projectively equivalent to this. You see, the Fano configuration, the Pappos configuration, the Desarc, this depends on parameters. They are not rigid configurations. They allow some coordinates, and that's why they are interesting. Now, uh, I want to come with the... Uh, uh, to the next topic, and this is surfaces and line configurations. This was, you can look at Campedelli, Burnia, Hirzabruck, and many others. Uh, also, I think, Urzua and Rouleau lately have been making good use of these methods. But I will not have time, of course. <laughs> time to explain, but the, let me explain the Hirzebruck coverings. So I get some lines, Li of x equals zero. This is a line in P2. And since we have, I don't need a picture. Now, uh, what I do is the following. The Kummer, the Hirzebruck Kummer covering of exponent n is obtained in the following way. Essentially, I take the nth roots of the rational functions, which are the quotients of this. But I can put it like this. I assume that these lines are independent. And so i is from 1 to k. So the linear forms give me a linear map of P2 in PK minus 1. This here is variable Y. Now, I use the fact that PK minus 1, every projective space, has a map which is given by the nth power map. So in other words, I take the nth root of each coordinate here. So this is a covering, this is Galois, and the group is z modulo n to the k minus 1, because the diagonal action is trivial. And now I take the pullback, y, and then take s, the minimal model. These are the Hirzebruck Kummer coverings of the plane. And y singular is singular if there are triple points. There are vertices, there are three points of valency at least three. So if in the configuration each time I get a point and they pass strictly more than two lines, I get a singular curve. So 
why did uh, why did Hirzebruck uh, come out with this? Well, let me do some numbering. So there are the Hitzebrooks. Ball quotients. So you take these configurations, you take n equal 5, and the complete quadrangle Then you take n equal 3 and the dual Hesse configuration or n equal 5 and the Hesse configuration I also thought so Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, I wrote 5 in effect, 5 and 3 So, the Hesse configuration is this configuration of, uh, of these four triangles, these 12 lines, and with these points. And this is the dual one, so these are nine lines. Now, the upshot is that S is a smooth surface has universal cover which is a still there is biholomorphic to the unit ball in C2 these are the Z1, Z2 such that Z1 squared in absolute value plus Z2 squared in absolute value is smaller than 1 This was a breakthrough. Well, existence was already proven by um, Borel, but not explicitly. And this was done around 1983. So the universal covering is the ball, and so it, the consequences are that S is rigid. The other consequences is that the universal covering is Stein and well the universal covering is contractible because it's a ball and C1 squared of S is equal to 3C2 which is the maximum. according to the Bogomolov Mia Oka Yao inequality. So uh, I should mention as pointed out by Valeria Alexev the other day, he says, okay, what about the the Fano configurations? You see it's still there, seven lines and seven points. Now, this happens only, you see, it doesn't contradict this because this inequality holds for surfaces over the complex numbers. And then I did at home the calculation. So if you take uh, n equal 3, n equal 5, and the final configuration, it turns out that c1 squared over c2 is 4 plus 3 over 39. So it's really quite higher, but turns out that this was an idea which was uh, done by some 10 years ago by a student of Akil 
Robert Easton. So anyhow, in, I'm not very interested in pathologies in characteristic too, but anyhow, the, this is another application. Um, now, uh, why are these coverings, uh, why are these coverings important? Can I take back the time of the introduction or? Pardon? Yeah, sure, sure, yeah, no, don't worry. I just wanted to say that importance um, is the following, is that, so, so lately uh, with that Weiler, We found some surfaces which are again related to configuration of lines, except that we take. I mean, the configuration of this uh, uh, this configuration here is the same configuration over p1 times p1, where here x is zero, one infinity. The same is for y, and then you have here y equal x and what we so if you make this change of variables and then you see that we constructed something uh, wn is we take some covering we take the nth root of somehow this n points and then we take the nth root of y0, y1, y1 minus y0 times uh, y1 uh, minus y so essentially we take a covering of this so it's a covering of group Zn squared branch of the, this configuration and the main point is that this is a family of cyclic covering of the line and when we take so uh, take cyclic coverings and you take the integrals this is an old theory which was started by Lauricella and Picard and so on and so what we did we um, we constructed this theorem uh, that in this way we constructed uh, we get a vibration so the, f the first projection induces a holomorphic map from the surface onto B B is the curve defined by this equation such that uh, the direct image of uh, the relative canonical sheaf is not semi-ample. And this contradicting uh, a question posed by Fujita in 1982. So Fujita proved that, that this direct image is the direct sum of an ample and uh, a unitary flat bundle and posed the question whether it's semi-ample. And it turned out that this problem was open for more than 30 years and you see that the counterexample, at least I've been trying to convince you that is extremely uh, simple and is again and 
it's again, first we got the first counterexample, then I got to this, and then I realized that it was related to this, and if you want to know more about this, you can listen to the talk by Ingrid Bauer tomorrow, and sorry for going over time. <laughs>